The scripture reading for today is going to be from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a, camp in co- in, though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. The war rise against me. In spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock, and, my, and now my head will be lifted above my enemies around me. I will offer in his tent sacrifices and with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, for you have been my help. Do not abandon me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level place because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as a breath... Uh, and as such, breathe out violence. I would, have despi- uh, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, good morning. You know, the first time you get asked to preach somewhere, it's kind of like when your wife asks you to do the laundry, you can choose to throw a red sock in with the whites, and you'll never get asked to do the laundry again. So we'll, we'll see how this goes this morning, whether you ever see me again. Um, it really is a, a privilege to be able to share the word with you this morning. We're going to be in Acts chapter 12, um, and if you're one of those people that are already wondering when lunch will start... This is going to be an easy gauge this morning because we're going to do Acts chapter 12. So as we move along in the chapter, you'll know exactly when we're going to finish because the closer I get to the end of the chapter, you'll know lunchtime's on its way. Now, there's no clocks here, so um, I asked Preston. He said we can go two to three hours if necessary, so (laughs) we'll see how long we go this morning. Um, This is a a topic I really wanted to talk about. partly because I think we so often take it for granted. We so often will say, really, a Christian platitude that God is in control. I I think there are very few believers in this room that would argue with that, that would say, well, no, God is only in control some of the time. But I wonder if we live lives that really prove we believe that. Because it's one thing to say we believe God is in control. It's another thing to live a life that reflects that. Uh, Because if we're being perfectly honest, we live in a world of uncertainty. Uh, We watch the news every day. All you got to do is watch the news for 10 minutes and realize the world at times seems crazy. There's uncertainty all around us within governments, within world disasters, uh, within our own families. I mean, it doesn't, we don't always have to talk about things that are huge to look around and wonder, is God in control? There's struggles within marriages. There is struggles with our children, school, jobs. Um, And I think if we're being completely honest, the the things that affect the world, the church is not hidden from those, is not exempt from that. And It's one thing for us to sit here today and say, I believe God is in control. But it's another thing to live a life that proves that. And what I want us to see today in Acts chapter 12 um, is an incredible picture of God's sovereignty. A beautiful picture that God is in control when nothing else makes sense. That he truly does have a plan that perhaps we serve a maker and a creator that actually sees a much bigger picture than we can realize. Maybe he sees things that we don't see. 
Maybe he asks of us to trust when we don't understand. And in this passage, we're going to see an incredible picture of God's sovereignty and control when everything else goes wrong. One of my favorite quotes is by James McDonald, and he says that God rules the universe with his feet propped up. And I love that because it shows this picture that God is not stressed out by world events. God is not worried about your job. God is not struggling with the struggles within your marriage. That doesn't mean he's not concerned, and that doesn't mean he doesn't speak into those. But to think that God in somehow and in some way does not know what he's doing is an inc- incorrect way to see our Savior. So we're, we're going to begin in verse 1. And just a little heads up, the way I teach um, is uh, I like to imagine the situation. Well, let me roll these up. And you know what that means when a preacher rolls his sleeves up. Absolutely nothing, because it just means I'm hot. <laughs> so <laughs> it just means I'm a little warm, so don't get excited about something's coming. Um, but the way I teach um, is I, maybe I have too active of imagination, uh, but I like to imagine the moments that we're going to read. And, and kind of put myself and try and figure out how would I feel in these moments. So we're going to go through this passage and we're going to stop and kind of talk through it. Well, really, we're not going to talk. I'm going to talk. You're going to listen. I guess if you have questions, you can bring them up. But in general, I'm going to be speaking through this. Uh, but we're just going to take breaks as we go through the chapter and, and expound to see what this looked like in these moments and try to put ourselves uh, in this situation and see how would we react in the same type of situation. So we'll, we'll begin in Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. It says, About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of the unleavened bread. It, let's stop there for just for a moment. I think sometimes we have this romantic idea of the first century church. We often will say, man, if we could just be like the first century church. Whenever I hear that, I think, have you read Acts? Uh, Because I don't know if I want to be in this situation. That it was not romantic at this time. They were not sitting in beautiful buildings being able to hear the word of God preached. They were being dragged out of their houses and murdered in the streets and thrown into prison. I mean, we just see here, James has been put to death by the sword. Now, think about this for a minute. The church is in its infancy. It's just beginning. Uh, they're still trying to figure things out. They don't, they don't have ordinances. They don't know what they're really doing. They've got all these people coming to faith. They're trying to lead them and shepherd them. And then James, the number, really the number three guy of the apostles. You know, they, obviously, the apostles were all equal. But I think in all of our minds, the, we see the most active three apostles are Peter, James, and John. And James, the brother of John, is already dead. Jesus spent three years with him, and you think, well, that was a waste of time. I mean, within the first year of the church being birthed, he's already dead. And Peter is now arrested. Now, we can sit back and think, well, this is happening in history, but think for a moment of what this would have been like for them. That Herod sees that this pleased the Jews, that killing of James was good news for them. And so now they're going to, he's arrested Peter. And there's great uncertainty in the middle of this. And look at verse 4. It says, and when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. So there's 16 people guarding Peter when he's in prison. 16 people. Now there's a reason for this. Herod knows that Peter's a flight risk. That if we go back to Acts chapter 5, Peter was arrested in Acts chapter 5, but an angel shows up and he gets released. So Peter's, and Herod's thinking, not this time. I'm going to make sure he's got lots of people on him. In the second half of verse 4, it says, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. Now, make no mistake, that's, that's fancy Christian Bible talk for when it says bring him out, it means in the morning Peter was going to be put to death just like James. So picture what's going on here. James is dead. Peter will be dead in the morning. But I love verse 5 because it says, So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Earnest prayer. That, that verse has always captivated me. Because it wasn't they were just in prayer. They were in earnest prayer. And I, I wonder how many times 
in our lives, we've really spent time in earnest prayer. I think we spend time in prayer, I hope. We have our Bible study, and then we pray, and we pray before our meals. But how much of that prayer is earnest? And I think often the level of our prayer is tied directly to what we're asking for. It's one thing to pray, thank you for this hot dog I'm about to eat. It's another thing to pray when your spouse has cancer and you're praying that God would do something about it. I think there's an earnestness meter that you could tie between the two, between the effects of what you're asking the Lord to do. And they're an earnest prayer. So here's the first thing I want us to see this morning. God is in control when we suffer. Now make no mistake, suffering is part of life. I think there's this false understanding that if we become a believer, that somehow we'll be removed from the world of suffering. We are not removed from that. In fact, we are guaranteed it. And in John 16, Jesus clearly says, I promise you, you will have trouble in this world. I promise you, it will happen. But take heart because I've overcome the world. So to think that, well, if I become a believer, then all of a sudden there will be no trouble, that's not a true statement. In fact, we see the direct opposite in Scripture. And what we see in this passage is trouble is hitting the church on all sides. James is dead. Peter will be dead by morning. They are suffering. These are men they dearly love. These are men that have brought them to Christ. These are the men who are supposed to lead them into the new generation. And they're dying left and right. Things looked bad. A few years ago, um, we were serving in Central Asia and we were at a, a, a city uh, in the north of our country uh, at a friend's was having a baby shower. And um, so we were away from our home and where we were living. And uh, the, there were a bunch of families that kind of came in to celebrate this baby shower. And um, we were staying inside uh, an office. They had a little office in the town because, so we could stay for free because we were cheap. Um, and so it was a free place to stay. And so they had some mattresses on the ground. And I remember that night going to bed... And it was a new city for us, and it was loud out on the streets. And I just thought, well, that's interesting. It's just loud noises, and people were out talking, and it just was different. I just thought it was a different city. And, you know, obviously, I have a, I'm American, if you couldn't figure that out. Um, and so we have a lot of friends in the States. And so I keep, I keep my phone on silent at night because people would text us at night. And so um, t- this night, my, my phone was over on a desk while I was sleeping. Well, I was laying in, probably because I was laying on the ground, I wasn't super sleepy. Uh, But I noticed my phone kept lighting up in the middle of the night. And I thought, what in the world? So finally, I got up to look at my phone. And there's all these text messages from people in the States that are saying, are you okay? Do you know what's going on? Tell us what, how you're doing. How's your family? Where where are you? Are you safe? And I thought, what is happening? (laughs) I don't know what's going on. So there's a TV in the office, we turn it on and we see there's a coup attempt. Um, taking place in the middle of the night in our country. And a coup attempt had happened in the 80s in the same country, and um, people had been drugged out in the street and killed during that time. And so we're at this moment, to be real honest, freaking out. Like, what do we do? Because we're not near our home. We can't go to an airport. How do we get out of the country if we need to? Um, because it's, it's one thing to die in the service of serving Christ overseas as a missionary. It's another thing to die just simply because you're an American. I'm not for that. I'm just, I'm against that. Um, let me just make that general stand. Uh, I do not support that. Um, but there, there was this moment of panic. And as we began to look outside, we realized there were people with automatic weapons walking around the streets. There were chants. Everybody was getting, and I, we didn't know who was for what. In that moment, we knew there would be suffering in this country. We knew there may be suffering with our friends. And there was great uncertainty. But as we gathered that night to pray, there was just a moment when we remembered that God is in control. Even when nothing makes sense around us, even in a moment to it that feels like great suffering is about to come, and we always wonder, is God in this suffering? We can know that God is. That faithfulness in Christ is not an exemption from suffering. Now, you may be thinking, well, I appreciate that, Scott. 
but I'm much more sincere in my walk. Now, you may not be saying this in your mind, but you might be thinking something like, I walk much closer with Jesus than you do. The closer you get to Jesus, the more safe you are. And I think Paul would take an exception to that. In fact, pretty much the New Testament would take an exception to that thinking. But I want you to hear this morning, sincerity does not exempt you from suffering. Now, you may also thinking, but not only am I sincere, but I work really hard. You know, when Dan asks for volunteers, I jump up and go do it. I work hard. I, I serve in Sunday school. I do the prayer time. I lead a Bible study. I, I work hard for Jesus. Service is not an exemption from suffering. And then I think last what people think is, well, but I've walked with the Lord a long time. You know, I got saved when I was young. I've walked with him all the days of my life. He knows me really well, and he knows I'm not a fan of suffering. And he loves me, so of course he would keep me from it. And I can tell you this morning, stature is not an exemption from suffering. It is a guarantee. Let's just get it out there and own it. It is a guarantee. And when suffering comes, people always ask why. And here's the problem. What we do with God is we, we take our circumstances and we draw a dotted line to God's character. If things are bad, God is bad. If things are good, God is good. But that's not the picture we see in Scripture. That's not what's happening in this moment. They're not drawing a line to God's faithfulness and saying, well, God isn't good because James is dead and Peter will be dead in the morning. What they see is that God is in control in their suffering. And they're not running to the the authorities. They're not going to the Sanhedrin. They haven't called their congressmen. They haven't talked to their prime minister. All they've done is they've beseeched the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Because they know if change is going to happen, it's not going to be through governments. It's not going to be for the religion. It's going to be through the king of kings. And so they're making earnest prayer because they know God is in control in this moment. Which brings us to our second point. God is in control even when there seems to be no way out. Look at verse 6. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. Think about this for a minute. Peter is going to die in the morning. He knows it. But what is he doing? He's sleeping. Peter's thinking, I'm going to see Jesus in the morning. I'm going to be well rested. And so I'm, I'm going to take some sleep. Apparently, Peter knew something that we need to grasp. God is in control. You sleep well at night knowing God is in control. I don't know how many times I've laid awake at night, wondering, pondering, letting my mind just go nuts with whatever's happening at work or with family or with friends. We don't see that with Peter. Peter had a much bigger problem about to happen in the morning than a presentation or preaching a sermon the next day or having to do something at work. Peter was going to be brought out before them and probably die a horrible death. The Romans weren't known for their charitable killings. So in the morning, he was going to die a horrible death, but he's getting good sleep because he understood God was in control. We're down to the wire. There seems to be no way out. And Peter's getting some good rest. But in verse 7 it says, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. God's timing is always perfect. Now this doesn't mean this is always how God acts. And this is, let me take a side note here real quick. Because I don't want us to equate, Oh, so if I believe hard enough... God's going to show up. Even if it's the last minute, he's going to change the circumstance. You know, sometimes God just lets the suffering happen because there's a greater plan. But in this moment, his timing is perfect. Peter is sleeping well. In fact, we're going to see it. But God has a different plan. It says in the second half of verse 7, he struck the angel, he struck Peter on the side and woke him up, saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. Now, this is an interesting verse because... This word struck is the same word that's used in Luke twenty two forty four when Peter cut the ear off of the temple guard, that he struck him. That's how hard he hit him. This, this is a picture of Peter is out. This, is, well, this was a restful night. That's what I really love about this. Peter's not just kind of one eye sleeping, where's Jesus going to show up? Uh, I'm supposed to leave the church. No, it's just I'm out. God's in control. I'll see you in the morning. The angel has to hit him to wake him up. So he, he, 
he hits him, and the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. I picture this like a mom who's trying to get that child out of bed for school. Peter is sleeping hard, and she's like, okay, put on your shoes, Peter. Get up, man. And then he even says, and then he did so, and he said to him, wrap your cloak. Come on, you're naked, man. Put your clothes on. (laughs) Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that he was, what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And in verse 10, when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them on its own accord. Angels don't touch doors, apparently. And they went out and went along one street. And immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, so he's still groggy. He still hadn't had his first cup of coffee, apparently. He said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. It was a miracle, but it came at the last moment. There was a purpose that Peter needed to be in prison. Because I think that's often what we think through is, well, couldn't God have done this another way? And that's because we can only see our part of life, really. We're, we're kind of like horses with blinders. There's a reason why they put blinders on horses during races. They don't want them to see anything else but the finish line. They want them looking straight ahead, not at the other horses, not the other riders. Look straight ahead. And that's the way we see life. And we have to take a moment in faith to step back and say, no, perhaps the God of the universe, the one who spoke creation into existence, possibly knows more than I do and can see a much greater situation in this. Because to be real honest, there is no over with God. One way or the other, God finds a way. And that doesn't mean to bring us out of it. Sometimes the answer is death. But for a believer, that's probably the best news we will ever get. It's kind of weird. It's the best and worst news all at the same time. But for Peter at this moment, it was not over. God stepped in, and he had a perfect plan. When... um, we moved here to the Czech Republic. Um, you know, we started just trying to pray through the state of the church and the state of believers. And, um, you know, it's Europe. I mean, we're, we're in Europe now, and it's different than Central Asia. But then we began to look at kind of the statistics of the Czech Republic. And that the Czech Republic, out of all of Europe, is considered the most irreligious. That um, when we served in Central Asia, the people we served with would say, To be them was to be Muslim. When we were in the UK, and we were serving in the UK, I mean, the Brits really liked hedges more than they liked people. I mean, Brits like their castles. They're very proper and respectful and sweet people. But they're also, it's a place that God is not known. And I think there's often a thought that if you're in Europe, then everybody's Christian. And the more we looked at the Czech Republic, we saw that, Considered in Europe, it's considered the least evangelized in all of Europe. There are fewer believers here than anywhere else. And you think, is God in control? Does he know what he's doing? But it's not over yet. The fact that the clock keeps ticking is proof that it's not over yet. There is still hope. There's a reason why we sit here today as the church of God. To make him known to the ends of the earth. Because he's worthy of that. It's not over until Jesus says it's over. And really, in the end of this, God has no problem bringing us to the end of ourselves pretty regularly. We have this moment where there's great suffering. We have to believe God is in control. We have this moment where there seems to be no way out and God shows up. God is in control even when there feels like there's no way out. Now, back in the passage, verse 12, it says, Then he realized this. When he realized this, so Peter is waking up, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other, whose other name was Mark, where the, many were gathered together and were praying. Now, I don't know, don't raise your hand, but I don't know if you know what it's like to escape out of prison. Um, if you have... Let's keep that to yourself. Um, But he's basically escaped out of prison. And he goes to where he knows people are praying. He goes to the church. 
He goes to the most important place that he can imagine. And he shows up. And in verse 13, it says, When he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl, a young girl, probably with the original language, under 12 years old, named Rhoda, came to answer. So they're at the outside gate. You have the building, then you have the gate. She hears somebody knocking. She goes out there. They're all in earnest prayer inside, just praying and praying and praying. And then she goes out and recognizing Peter's voice. So we don't know what Peter said, but he's probably like, hey, open up the door. It's Peter. Well, I guess he didn't because she just recognized his voice. It's time to open up the door. Let me in. In her joy, which I absolutely love, just how scripture paints a picture, she did not open the door, open the gate. She left him standing out there. The, the jailbreaker is now standing out in the street still, um, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. So picture this for a moment. They are in earnest prayer. They're in this prayer meeting. And I think we can pretty much imagine who they're praying for. Peter's supposed to be dead the next morning. I imagine they're in desperate prayer that God would do something. And, and maybe at this point they're just saying, God, there's no hope for Peter, so help us. We don't really know what they're praying, but I'm, I'm guessing and I'm inferring that this was a prayer meeting about Peter. They all showed up and they're praying earnestly. But when she comes in and says, Peter's at the door, they say in verse 15, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting, no, it's him. It's him. Peter's at the door. And they say, no, it's his angel. Now, this cracks me up a little bit. Because I got to tell you, if somebody ran in here right now and said, Drew is outside. And they're like, and, some, and Preston stands and said, no, it's not Drew. It's an angel. I mean, I'm mowing down some women and children because I want to go see an angel. I don't, you may not want to be in the way because if somebody says there's an angel outside, I'm not going to be like, well, let's keep praying. I'm going to say, angel time. See ya. And women and children aside, you just got to go see it. But they don't do that. And there's a reason why. Because look at specifically what it says. It's, it doesn't say there's an angel outside. It says his angel is outside. So what does that mean? What it means is they're in this desperate prayer meeting, and they believe Peter's already dead. They're praying that God will do something, but they don't believe he'll do anything. Which is my third point, that God is in control even when our faith is weak. There is a to call it a misunderstanding would not be accurate. It's really a heresy uh, that is often taught that our faith somehow handcuffs God. And it's a completely misunderstanding of Scripture and taking passages out. Now, that, now don't, don't hear me say that faith is not important. Faith does please the Lord. But do not think for a second this morning that God can only act if you believe hard enough. Do not think that there is a direct tie between your faith and the actions of our Lord. Now, our faith somehow moves the heart of God, and I think there's a lot of mystery to it. But it is a heresy to now think that your faith somehow is the only way God will act, that He is impossible to act unless we believe. My, um, my mentor, when I first came into ministry, um, was such a warm and kind man. In fact, he was interesting. He was also very real and genuine. Um, I once served under a pastor that was super bright, I mean, super intelligent, would, you know, study his Greek Bible when we would meet together, and he would show me, okay, this is what passage means, and I'm, you know, I'm in my early 20s, 19, 20 years old, and he'd say, this is, okay, I know you're looking at your English, but in the Greek, this is, and I remember leaving his office going, I will never be in ministry, because those dudes are nerds. Um, <laughs> and so, and then this new pastor came to our church. And uh, he was very genuine. He was very transparent, um, very real with his struggles. And not that he wasn't just as brilliant. Um, but I, I ended up going on staff with him. And um, his first advice to me when dealing with somebody who's struggling or suffering was, don't say anything stupid. <laughs> and I thought, well, I want to say that's a wise, sage thing to say, but I would think that's a little obvious. And uh, it was my first day on staff. I'm going to chase a rabbit here for a minute, so just settle in. Um, here's the story. I, it was, I was 20 years old. I think it was 20 at the time. I was just a kid. I didn't know what I was doing. 
I had, I had not gone to seminary yet. I was just on staff. It was my very first day. And one of the guys in our church had a heart attack. Now, this wasn't just any guy in our church. This was the guy in the church that everybody was like, I don't know why he comes anymore. That dude is mean. And he just would say stuff to tick people off. He was just kind of this surly, mean old man. And he has a heart attack. Well, my pastor is out of town. And he calls me. My first day on staff, he's at a conference. And he says, hey, we'll call him Tom. Just to, Not that anybody knows who it is. But we'll just say, Tom, Tom has had a heart attack. And you need to go see him in the hospital. It's my first day on staff. I'm like, okay, what do I do? He's like, well, you, and when you get there, you're, his wife's not going to be there either. You're going to be the first one. And so then he tells me basically how to get in the hospital, those kind of things. And then I said, okay, that's all great, but what do I do when I show up? I mean, it's Tom we're talking about here. You're, I think this is why you went out of town, because you didn't want to do this. <laughs> and so as we're in the call, he said, hey, the conference is starting again. i got to run in. Just don't say anything stupid. And then he hangs up. <laughs> and so I... I get in my car, and I go to the hospital, and I have my Bible. This young little preacher boy has no idea what I'm going to say, and I'm just praying, Lord, just help me not say anything stupid. Just help me not say anything stupid. I don't really know what that means, but we'll do it. So I show up, and there's Pat sitting up in bed. I almost said his name, just looking at me, grumpy as ever, even more grumpy because he's just had a heart attack. (laughs) And he's sitting there, and he's got his arms crossed. And so I walk in, I have my Bible, and I just stand. And he looks at me and says, well, what do you got? (laughs) And I said, all I know is I'm not supposed to say anything stupid. (laughs) And I just stood there, and he laughed and laughed. And to this day, if he sees me, he says, have you said anything stupid lately? Um, But I understood once that day was over and and my pastor came back, and I said, I need a little bit more information then don't say something stupid. And uh, he began to share where that came from, that um, he had lost his wife to cancer with four young children, and he ended up raising them by himself. Um, And he said, when my wife was very sick, we were in a church uh, in the central United States, and uh, we were doing ministry with everybody. Everybody knew my wife well. Um, And when she got sick, the church was gracious Um, My wife passed away, and during the recovery time, um, many people came by. And he said, i got to tell you, when when people are suffering and and hurting, they won't remember anything you say, really. They'll remember that you were there, but they will remember if you say something stupid. And I was like, what does that mean? And he said, well, shortly after my wife passed away, I was in a grocery store. I needed to feed my family. I was still really struggling. A woman from our church came up to me and said, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry about your wife. And you know, he was gracious, said, yes, I know, and I appreciate that. And um, she said, and said, I guess she should have believed more, and then she would have lived. And he said it took everything within him not to jump on this poor woman in the aisle because she had equated her unfaithfulness to God's character, that that she died because either he didn't believe hard enough or she didn't. Not that God was in control, but he didn't believe enough. And what a horrible thing to say to a widow, widower, standing there in an aisle right after he'd buried his wife, that if you would have believed more, your wife would have lived. And somehow we equate our faith with how God reacts. And it's simply not true. We're seeing it in this passage. They don't believe Peter can make it through this. They believe he's already dead. But God still showed up. God is in control even when our faith is weak. Make no mistake about it. God is in control even if you don't believe right. God is in control. Verse 16. It says, but Peter continued knocking. (laughs) He's got to make a point. They obviously aren't going to come get him. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. Again, they didn't believe God could do this. God did it even though they didn't believe. But motioning to with them, so there's a commotion going on. They're pretty excited. And he's, okay, let's calm down for a minute. 
He motioned with them with his hand to be silent. He described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison, and he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Now, obviously, this is not James, the brother of John. He's dead, but James, the half-brother of Jesus, is who he's talking about. Then he departed and went to another place. Now, when the day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers. I mean, that's an understatement of the century. I mean, these guys were shackled to him. The morning comes, and there's a huge disturbance, a no little disturbance. So they're going a little nuts among the soldiers who over what had become of Peter. Peter's gone when they wake up. And this is, I mean, this is how arrogant Herod is. And after Herod's search, it's kind of like the soldier came and told Herod, Peter got out. Herod's like, no, I'm going to go look. I don't believe it. I mean, the guy was shackled to him. I think he would know if Peter wasn't there. But Herod's like, no, I, I need to go see this for myself. So Herod does a search for him, and he didn't find him. He examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Because remember, if a prisoner escaped, you received the punishment that was due that prisoner. So we clearly know that Peter was going to die the next day because now they're sentenced to death because that would have been Peter's sentence. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea, and spent some time there. This is an interesting moment. Peter explains what's happened to him. Now the soldiers are the one in distress. And now they're going to be put to death because Peter has escaped. When um, Over the last two years, we've, we've had some visa issues along the way. Um, we, over a 12-month period, had to move, I think it was 16 different times, uh, which was not an easy thing to do. We moved from Central Asia, the UK had visa problems, were kindly asked to leave the UK, came to the Czech Republic, and then when we were here, and within 60 days, we were beginning to have visa problems here. Apparently, we're not well-liked uh, where we show up. And we were on, it, was, it was a difficult time, because we had been through so much transition, uh, so much struggle, and I came home one day where we had been told, okay, we're, you're going to have to move again because your visa, uh, we need more time to work on your visas here. Uh, oh, no. And so I come home, and my wife is visibly upset, and I'm trying to bring some comfort, and she's sitting on the little stairs stoop in our house, and there was no little disturbance in our house, I'll say that. Um, she was at the end of a rope and really struggling that we would have to move again and didn't think she could do it again to uproot our family again. And so I said, well, maybe we should spend some time in prayer in this. And, and just in pure, real rawness, she said, why? It doesn't seem to make a difference. We've been praying about this for a long time and he's just gonna do what he wants anyways. And it was true. I thought, in, in my mind, I thought, amen, that's wrong. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> what am I supposed to say to that? I'm feeling the exact same way. Uh, but God was gracious in that to remind us that he was in control even of governments. And he was in control when things weren't going to make sense, and if we had to move again, then we would follow him there too. But in that moment, it sure didn't feel like we wanted to do that. And in this moment of, of a struggle of a people really believing if God can do something, we, show, we see that God showed up. There was a bigger plan. There was much more going on here. And in fact, what happens here at the end of, of verse 19, it says, Herod went down to Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now, you may be thinking, what does that mean? And that's an important moment, actually. Um, if you had your Bibles and you went to those inspired maps in the back, you'd basically see that, that Herod went from the hill country to the coast. Herod went on vacation. He'd have enough of these apostles just escaping out of prison, making him look foolish. So he's put the guards to death and now he's going on vacation. He's getting out of there. Which kind of brings us to our final point. God is in control even when the wicked seem to prosper. Herod is a ruthless, ruthless man. Kills people on whims, kills people because he feels like it, kills people to be popular. 
and he's going on vacation to the coast. He's headed out. In verse 20, it says, Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country, the king's country for food. So basically what has happened is he's gone on vacation down to the coast to a people that he's basically making suffer because he's mad at them. We don't really know what it is, but knowing Herod's character, they probably said something wrong, so he cut off their food supply. So they've, they've basically gotten a hold of Blastus, who's really his calendar guy, and somehow got on his calendar while Herod's on vacation, and they've got a chance to speak with Herod. So they've come before it, and this is, this is what it says, verse 21. On that appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, jerk, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. Now, it's hard for us to imagine what's happening here, because... We can't picture it, but I'm grateful that um, Josephus, the Jewish historian, actually records this event. He describes it in his histories, and this is how he described it. He says, on the second day of the spectacle, so it wasn't, I mean, we were just reading, it feels like Herod just kind of came out with a robe on and sat down, but it was much grander than this. I mean, Herod thought very highly of himself. And so he's on vacation. He's like, I'm going to put on a show for these people who would dare not um, give their support to me. It says, On the second day of the spectacle, glad in a garment woven completely of silver, so that its texture was indeed wondrous, he entered the theater at daybreak. There the silver, illuminated by the touch of the first rays of the sun, was wondrously radiant, and by its glitter inspired fear and awe in those who gazed intently upon him. So now you can see it. Herod comes out with this robe that basically looks like a disco ball, in my imagination. (laughs) The sun is just coming up. You know, it's over the coastline. The ocean's behind him. You can hear the crashing waves. The sun hits it, and it's just like, oh, my goodness, look at him. Oh. I mean, it's probably what you thought this morning when I got up. You were like, oh, so handsome. Um, Now, they were thinking, now you're not going to get that out of your mind. But so you're picturing this. And they see Herod, and they're just amazed at him. They see this incredible beauty of his garments. So basically, Herod walks out, and he feels untouchable. This wicked, wicked man is at the top of of his life. And I wonder if we ever have moments where something happens, and we think, God, get him. I wish, God, you would just get him right now. Just do something. I mean, give him a cold at least or something. Make him sneeze. (laughs) You know, he really hurt my feelings. Or he said something he shouldn't have. Or he's really just not a, he's a wicked person. Why does everything seem to go right with him? I mean, we look around a world, and let's be honest, the wicked prosper. There are people who defame the name of God spit upon who he is, and they seem to be everything just grand and, gent- and wonderful for them. And maybe I'm only alone in this room that thinks, I mean, God, do something. Get them. Now, granted, I'm glad God doesn't think like I do. Because um, if I was God, we'd all be dead. I would have <laughs> wiped everybody out. But God obviously has a bigger plan. And in verse 22, Herod, in this grand moment... One of the people in the crowd shouts, this is the voice of a God, not of a man. And I can imagine he's just eating this up. Yeah, about time they recognize who I am. Look at my jacket. He's feeling good about it. But look at God's reaction to sin. In verse 23, it says immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. It almost feels like God added that little line of eaten by worms just to show, yeah, you're impressive. Worms are going to eat you. And here's, this is God's natural reaction to sin. This is what, he breaks out against sin. The fact that the clock keeps ticking is God's grace that he has not broken out against sin. 
I think there's a great way to say it is that every dog will have his day. And realistically, when we see the wicked prosper, instead of saying, get him, God, we should take a step back and realize what that means. Because God's wrath is not like our wrath. God's wrath is not, well, I'll just have him trip as he's walking up to the podium, and that'll be funny. Because I'd probably be like, oh, that's a pretty good one, Lord. That'd be a good one. <laughs> that's not how he reacts to sin. The Lord breaks out against sin. He destroys it. And the punishment is an eternity separated from God in hell. And I think we often struggle with the holiness of God because of that. We'd rather think, well, that seems a little severe. Is anybody really that wicked? Because, I don't know about you, but eternity is a long time. You might have been thinking, this guy has been talking for a long time. Eternity is a long time. (laughs) And we wouldn't wish that on our worst enemy. But the fact that hell is eternal is a reflection of the one who was sinned against. Years ago, I was... uh, in the Middle East, and I was meeting with a, a taxi driver who we stopped, and I mean, such a, I mean, they're such a warm people. Um, we were in, I was in Jordan, and uh, you know, I'd just taken a taxi to get home, and we were talking on the way home, and he was just like, well, let's go get some tea. I'm like, what? All right, let's get some tea. He's like, don't you have to work? Not right now, we'll get some tea. And so we were talking and, and discussing just in general, uh, often when I'm, I'm Speaking with someone from a Muslim background, I really focus on um, how, in, how vile sin is and God's reaction to it. Um, and to, to understand that sin separates us from God. And that it is, it is not something we can take lightly and just, well, ah, sorry about that, God. See you tomorrow. It, it, it is a serious offense against the creator of the universe. And he was just like, I don't know. I, don't know. I think God can just forgive I said, really? And so I was sitting there with him, and I said, so there were some kids standing outside, and I said, what if I went over and punched that guy in the face? He was probably 16 to 18 years old, and he was like, what? I was like, I'm just curious. What would happen if I punched him in the face? And he was like, well, I don't know. Those dudes probably would punch you back in the face. I was like, yeah, I guess the punishment fits the crime. And I said, but what if a police officer walked by here, and I jumped up and punched him in the face? And he'd say, oh, you would get arrested and you would get punched in the face. I can tell you that right now. When they got you to the police station, they would rough you up. And at the time, uh, they, well, they, they still have a king. I said, what if the king was coming down the street? And king Hussein. And I ran out of this coffee shop and I punched him in the face. And he was like, whoa. I don't even know if we can say that in mixed company. As he said, you would never be heard of again. And I said, do you see the pattern? The person who is offended, the, the greater the person, the greater the punishment. When we sin against an eternal, perfect, holy God, the punishment is an eternal, horrible place. Understand this this morning. God will take care of wickedness. A day will come when time will end and his wrath will be poured out. But I don't know if as a people we should long for that day. I think we should have a tempered understanding of, yes, we want, Lord, please come quickly. But at the same time say, Lord, but there are so many that still need to hear. Because that punishment never ends. But I want you to hear this morning that God is in control even when we look around. And it seems like only the wicked prosper. In the midst of all this, in the middle of this story, we kind of come to the end of the chapter. That's one of my favorite moments. Because, you know, when you think about this, Stephen is dead. Stephen has been killed. James is dead. Peter's gotten out of prison, but he was in prison. This, that probably is not the end of their troubles and they know it's going to get worse. They know it's more trouble's on its way. Herod's going crazy, even though he's dead. Who knows who the next guy's going to be? Probably even worse. 
But all this struggle, all this craziness, I love verse 24. It says, but the word of God increased and multiplied. Make no mistake, God is in control when things don't make sense. God knows exactly what he's doing. When we suffer, he knows what he's doing. When our faith is weak, he knows what he's doing. When there feels like there's no hope or no way out, he knows what he's doing. And when people trample upon us and the wicked prosper, God knows what he's doing and he is in control. Let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you that you are in control when we don't understand. And I pray, Lord, even this morning that we would be a people that don't say that with our lips, but live lives that prove it. That we would sleep well at night. That when our minds begin to wander and our minds begin to think about things that we cannot control, I pray, Father, that your spirit would remind us of your greatness. And that we would rest well. And that we would trust you with our circumstances. That we would trust you with our lives. I thank you, Father, that no matter what happens around us, you are a God who's sovereign. I pray, Father, that we would believe that. Not just with the words of our mouth, but everything that we do. For you are worthy of worship, Lord. Thank you for this time in your word. I thank you, Father, that your word is living and active. I pray, Father, that we would be men and women who leave this place today overwhelmed with your greatness so that others may hear. That we would be jealous for your fame and your glory. And that when we go to work and when we meet with friends, Lord, that they would see a stark difference in our lives. And when they would wonder what it is, so that we can say we serve a God that is in control. Thank you for this time together, Lord. I pray that you're pleased with not only what we've said, but Lord, every attitude of our heart. We love you, Lord, and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.